Our subject for this morning, as you heard, the Holy Spirit and our salvation. Say it with me. The Holy Spirit and our salvation. Our secretary read from John chapter 16, 7 through 13. But we just want to highlight verses 12, 13 together. Let's read that um, uh, John chapter 16, verses 12, 13. So these two verses, John chapter 16, 7, sorry, 12 through 13. L listen what Jesus said. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall bear, hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Father, honor your word today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Holy Spirit and our salvation. For those of us who were in prayer meeting yesterday, Sister, the person who was in charge of prayer meeting, seemingly, they looked into my message and they said, well, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's who I'm going to speak about today, okay, as we speak about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is undoubtedly the third person of the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit as a person, he has similar characteristics of living beings. He, had the, he has the characteristics of intelligence, emotions, and will. That's what people have. As a person, characteristics of intelligence, of emotions, and will. Every person here today, you have what you call intelligence. We are all intelligent beings. And the church says, God has made, gave us five senses. And uh, our psychologists tell us there's a sixth one, the kinesthetic sense, sense of balance. So the fact that uh, we have five plus one, then it will make us very intelligent. But the Holy Spirit, he's far more intelligent than human beings. And that is why, as an intelligent being, he knows what is happening on the inside of us. He reads our thoughts. He knows our secrets. He knows our minds. That's the Holy Spirit. Then secondly, the Holy Spirit, as a person, he has what you call emotions. All of us as human beings, we have emotion. And if you have emotion, just wave and say, Amen. And Caribbean people, we are emotional people. And when things seem nice to us, we get very emotional. When we lose our loved ones, we get emotional. When things happen, we get emotional. So we as beings, we are emotional creatures. The Holy Spirit also has emotion. And then all of us, we have a will. And that is why your will is important when it comes to salvation. I am going to serve God. I will do this. I will do that. So we all have a will. And so the Holy Spirit then, he is intelligent. The Holy Spirit, he has emotions. And the Holy Spirit, he has a will. And that is why it makes him so important to us today. The point we are establishing is that the Holy Spirit is not a force. He is a person. So the Holy Spirit, because he possesses characteristics of human being or of a person, then the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit, he knows the things of God. Listen what, so he's in telly, listen what he says in verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, even the deep things of God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. For what a man knoweth the things of a man, save that the Holy Spirit of man, which is in him, that's the Spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of Almighty God. The thing that we want to say, the Holy Spirit, we cannot fool him. He is intelligent. He knows all we are about. He knows our upbringing and our downwardness. 
He knows all about us. And that is why he knows the very secret of our hearts. The Holy Spirit knows the things of God. And if you and I want to know the things of God, we must have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, listen to what he says in John chapter uh, 16, as we have read in verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus said, while I was on earth, he said to his disciples, there are a lot of things I want to say to you, but you cannot handle them. But when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit, he will come and he will reveal things unto you. I thank God every day for the gift of God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit as a person, he lives within our hearts so that we can talk to the Father. So I can call upon God. In the morning when I get up, I can call upon him because I can talk through the parts of the Holy Spirit and he take my word to the Father. And that's why Jesus said, he know, God says, he know the things of God. That's what Jesus said. He know the things of God. Intelligent. But also, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the Bible tells us, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So in other words, the Holy Spirit has emotions. If you're a husband, and you know your wife is cheating on you. You're going to express emotions. Those in my Sunday school class will follow as we go. Because we're dealing on these subjects. Or vice versa. If you know the husband is cheating on you. Are you going to just go up and say, honey, I love you in all of the world. And even though you're cheating on me. I still live in all the world. You're not going to do it that way. But you're going to go to him. Or you're going to go to her. And you're going to express emotions. I don't like what you're doing. I've been hearing this. I've been hearing that. And I'm not approve of it. I'm grieved. I'm angry. And that is why the Holy Spirit. You and I we can grieve him. And if God loves us, and if we're doing the things that we are not supposed to do, then God will be grieved. His Holy Spirit will be. And that is why as a person, you and I can grieve the Holy Spirit. So Paul writing to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, if you notice in the 30th verse, he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. As a person, you can grieve him. He can be angry. And when God is angry, he's real angry. And Paul says, don't get him angry. Because when you get him angry, he can cut you off. So he said, grieve not the Holy Spirit. So we first we notice the Holy Spirit is intelligent. Because he knows the things of God. You don't know it, but God, he knows. Secondly, we know that he can be grieving as emotion. Paul said we're not to grieve him. But we also notice that the Holy Spirit, he's a giver of wonderful things, our spiritual gifts. We call them to the church. And he gives the gifts as he purposes. In other words, he gives it as he will. You don't tell him what to do. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we pick up at verse 4. There are diversities of gift, but it's by the same Spirit. And there are differences of administration, but it's the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. To profit with her. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another he gives the word of knowledge. To another he will give her everything but by the what? The same Spirit. And this is what he says. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing. By the same what? So you say oh, he's giving it? 
to another the working of miracles, to another prophesy, prophecy, to another discerning of spirit, to another different kinds of languages, to another the interpretation of languages. And then the last verse said, but all these work it, that one and the same self spirit, dividing to every man severally as he purposes, as he will. The point I'm saying, you can't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. That is why God has gifted the church. God has given you different gifts. Gifts are different from talent. Talents are natural abilities you are born with. But gifts, they are refinement of the Holy Spirit. He refines what we have. And so he gives us, it's like he, he, he's, he, he sort of would put the ice cream, you know, on top of the cake. So that when you're a believer, only believers have spiritual gifts. I want to repeat it again. Only believers have spiritual gifts. If you're not a Christian, you have talents. That is why talent cannot grow the church of Jesus Christ. God has given gifts by his Holy Spirit so that the church can grow. Some of us he called to be teachers. So was he called to be evangelists? So was he called to be leaders? So was he called to be administrators? So was he called for different ministries? But it's by the same Holy Spirit. You cannot dictate to the Spirit what gift you should receive. But by his grace and his mercy, he has given you his gift so that the church can be edified. God wants his church to grow. Say it with me. No, I didn't say my church. I said God want what? His church. We are part of his church. That is why no man owns the church. The church belongs to God. And God gives it according as he wills. That is why you cannot dictate to the Holy Spirit the gift you are supposed to get. That's why whatever gifts he has given you, use it for kingdom building. Use it to glorify God. Use it to build the kingdom of God. Whatever he calls you to do, faithfully do what God has called you to do. And that is why I thank God for his Holy Spirit. So three things we notice as a person. He's intelligent. He has emotions. And he has will. God has, and listen to me carefully. Whatever your gift or gifts, I want to say to you, use it to build God's kingdom. The gifts were given not to build yourself. The fruit of the Spirit, that's what builds the believer. But the gift of the Spirit, that's what builds the church. You know, God knows that for his church to grow, the gifts have to be evident. And that is why he said to the disciples, I have many things to say to you, but I cannot, but you cannot bear them now. Too heavy, too powerful. But when my spirit is come, he will do the work. And we pray that God's spirit will be outpoured in his church. And that is our prayer as a body. We are praying, Lord, do something in St. John's village as we have never seen it happen before. It is not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. Say, God, God wants to build his church. And if God is building his church, the church will grow. That is why it's not about your... So, so, listen, don't pride yourself and say, without me, the church, nothing can happen. You're wrong. You drop down dead to a morning, the church still go on. And even Pastor Sharp raptured. Amen. I might be translated someday. Still church, still go on. And you know when people die, listen to me carefully, when people die, people make a lot of things at their funeral. Boy, some people ball, they never ball. Listen, they never even visit the sick. When the person was sick, they never even visited them. But my God, on the day of the funeral, oh, they show up. I want to do this part. I want to do that part. They get so excited, they show up. But where were you when the person was sick? Where were you when the person needed help? Where were you when the person needed a cup of cold water? Where were you? When the person was in the ICU, 
that you should have visited. Where were you? But when death comes, then often you want to be heard of. But you know what I notice also about life? We all have to die. And listen, all oh, listen, when you when you die, people forget about you. They didn't know that. They take you to the cemetery, they put you down six feet, and then bye bye, they cry a little, shed a little tear, and then they're on their way. Then they're gone and on something else. And you are working at an establishment, and you think that you're invincible, indispensable. They, listen, man, they replace you overnight. They just look for another person. And all the years you spend, you know, all the hard work, someone else replaces you. Yes, they always say it's a good But then they stop talking because they forgot about you. So all I'm saying, only what's done for Christ will last. That is why the church of Jesus Christ, that is why work for kingdom, work for the master. Because at the end of the day, you'll hear from him, well done, the good and faithful servant. Work for the master because payday is coming. Give God a praise because he's worthy. Then Romans chapter 5 tells us that the Holy Spirit... He also prays for us. Look at Romans chapter 5. Or sorry, Romans chapter 8. 26 through 28. Romans chapter 8. I'm sorry, 26 through 28. This is what Paul said right into the church at Rome. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth us in our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. With groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts. That's the spirit. He knows what is the mind of the spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints. According to the will of God. And we know. Say it with me. And we know. That all things work together. For good. To them that love God. To them that are called according to his purpose or according to his will. I want to tell you God will put it together. And it doesn't matter what you're going through. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. God loves you this morning. And regardless of what you're going through. We know all things going to be for your own good. Sometimes when I get down to pray. I don't surely know what to pray for or about. But often the Spirit of God will take my little words and take them before the throne of God and say, God, here's it, your servant, Ken Shab, is praying for you, is praying and praying for healing and praying for revival and praying for blessing. Hear the words of your servant. I'm saying to you, church, thank God for the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in the lives of believers. Give God some praise for him. So whatever you're going through, we know all things work together for what? Say it again. All things work together for? Not for bad. When you're a servant of God, everything, whatever comes in your life, God has a good plan. Amen. It's better than the plan. At state insurance. It's better than the plan. At Scotia Bank or ECB. It's better than any plan any government might have. God said I have a good plan. And when you get involved in God's plan. You'll never be on the losing time side. You'll be on the winning team. God's plan is a good plan. Sometimes the way might be rough. Sometimes the journey might be tedious. Sometimes there are interferences, even in that situation. But the God of Israel, he has a better plan, a good plan. God will see you through. Amen. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give in. Tell yourself, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. He loves you. 
And he has a good plan. Then we know that the Spirit of God, he works miracles. In Acts chapter 8, 38 through 39. And in that passage, Acts 8, 38. And he commanded the chariot, speaking of the Ethiopian eunuch, and with Philip the evangelist. He commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water. Both Philip and the eunuch. And the eunuch was baptized. 39. And when they were come out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. That the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Listen, it was a miracle how Philip met the eunuch. It was a miracle how Philip departed. In other words, God used Philip for his purpose, for his plan. That was over. And God said, Philip, time to move on. I want to say today, God is a miracle worker. For some of us in this service, we are praying for miracles in our families. We are praying for miracles in our bodies. We are praying for miracles in our situation. I want to tell you, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is a miracle worker. He has never, never lost a battle. Trust him. He will see you through. Give him some praise. He works miracles. He can still heal the blind brotherly. He can still heal those who are possessed by demons. He can still destroy the yoke that seemed to have you in bondage. God can come through for you. I don't care what you're going through today. I want you to trust the God of Israel. Yes, sir. He has never lost a battle. Your battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. And God will see you through. Give him some praise. He's worthy. There's a Greek word for, for spirit. And every time we see the word pneuma, word comes to mind. Air. A-I-R. Pneumatic. Pneumonia. All has to do with what? Or breathing or air. It shows the spirit of God is not neuter. It's not a neuter thing. N-E-U-T-E-R. But he's a definite person. So that, listen, as you breathe oxygen, so you and I, we need the Holy Spirit. Every Christian, you need the Holy Spirit. You cannot live victoriously in this life without the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you, had it not been for the Holy Spirit, I would not have been preaching here today. Sometimes the battle gets fierce. Sometimes, listen to me, the road is rough. Sometimes the journey seems impossible. But I want to tell you, he promised, I'll never leave you. Neither will I forsake you. The God who helped Moses at the burning bush, he's available today. The God who spoke at the Red Sea, come Moses, stretch your rod. Move forward. The God is here today. The God who shut the lion's mouth when, they, listen, Daniel needed that. He's available today. The God who spoke when Paul needed him. Yes, sir. God is here today. He's speaking. He knows your need. And he knows my need. Then the Holy Spirit wants the thing that he will do for you. Is that he brings conviction to every believer. Every person who doesn't know God. He convicts you of sin. And even when you become a believer. The Holy Spirit still brings conviction. He convicts us of sin. When you are a Christian. When you fall from grace. If you have said something that you are not supposed to say. The Holy Spirit. He nudges you. And the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you when you do the wrong things you're not saying. If you keep doing some things that you're not supposed to do, and the Holy Spirit continues to speak, and you're not listening, something is wrong. When the Holy Spirit, listen, he cares about us. Remember we say he's intelligent, he has emotions, he has emotions, he has a will. Because 
is a living being. And so he brings conviction. And what do we mean by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit? It's a placing of the truth of the gospel in a clear light before the sinner. So he acknowledges it as truth, whether or not he received Christ as his personal Savior. So when the Holy Spirit, listen, as an unsaved, you come to church, every message you hear, the Holy Spirit is speaking. Every time you enter a Sunday school class, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. The last funeral service you went to, the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And he says, you see that person in that casket? That's the end of the journey on earth. But not throughout eternity. And he speaks to us and he says to us, we need to think about our lives. Conviction. God tries to make the message as clear as possible. So that he said to the disciples, I have many things to say, but I can't say them now. But when I'm gone, when I depart, when I am taken away from you, then the Holy Spirit will come. In verse 8 of John chapter 16, verse 8, John chapter 16, the book we are in. And when he is come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's what he says. When he's come, he reproved the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus had to go. If Jesus was here, listen carefully, he would not be in church with us here and then at Beacon Light. Mm. If Jesus was in bodily form, he could not be at all saints and then at Bowlands. So one church would have him, the others wouldn't have him. So you see, people would fight. But God is a wonderful God. The Spirit of God can be everywhere at the same time. And that's why Jesus said it's a different ministry. When Jesus was here, he could not enter the hearts of men just so as a person. But it was by his Spirit that he was able to convict men of sin. And make the message real unto them. So that their soul could be touched. And that is why every day you come to God's house, mind what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul warned the Ephesians, grieve not the Spirit of God. So you can be a Christian and grieve him. If you're a liar, and you're always telling liars a Christian, the Holy Spirit is going to convict you. He's going to tell you it's wrong. Your friends might tell you, it's okay, man, it's a different time. The Holy Spirit says, I have not changed. I'm the same yesterday, today, and for part of the Godhead, part of the triune God. All Christians, we need the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, if we're going to, you know, say, for instance, if you watch a certain paper note or coin, for authenticity to be there, it will carry certain things. And then you can look at the, and you can say, that's authentic. Am I right? That's a true note. There are certain things that when people at the bank, the tellers, they got, they train them, they are taught. Certain things you need to look for. Look. Don't just look at the person's face. Because some faces, they're deceiving. And they'll come and laugh at you and they'll talk you. And mind, they're trying to use you. So if you work at the bank, you got to watch it as a teller. And some people, they are very skillful. They're always in conversation with the teller. So they can try, but the teller have to make sure, oh, you listen to what you watch. You watch. And so it is when you're a believer. We need to be authentic Christians. And you know who makes us authentic? The Holy Spirit. Paul says, therefore, let no man trouble me. Hear this. For I bear in what? My body. The mark of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're a Christian, you're different from the world. The natural man cannot understand the Spirit of God. That is why when you're a believer, you follow the Holy Spirit. You let him direct you. You let him guide you. You, make, you let him make decisions for you. And that when you speak, people say, boy, that's 
God is speaking through that man. God is speaking through that Christian. You live at home if you're a, if you're a husband. If your wife can't say God in you, something wrong. Are your Christian husband live home? If your wife can't say the God that you talk about, let's touch the home. Now, even you come to church and jump and jump and jump. You got to start at home. If your children cannot see Christ in you, something is wrong. We have to come to the cross, repent of our sins, and then the Holy Spirit, he comes on the inside as he convicts us of sin. And we say, yes, Lord, I surrender. In Acts chapter 26, and I want you to look at Acts chapter 26, 24, pick up at verse 24 through to 29. And as Paul spoke for himself, Festus, Governor Festus said with a loud voice, Paul now before the council, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning make you a madman. When the Spirit of God is with people, think you're mad. Remember on the day of Pentecost, they thought they were drunk. And Peter said, no, we aren't drunk. When you're a Christian, you behave differently. I didn't hear no amen. But you behave differently when you're a Christian. But listen, Paul, but he said, but he said, I am not mad. Look at the respect most noble festers. But I'm only speaking for the words of truth and of soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, King Agrippa, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded, fully convinced, that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. Verse 27. King Agrippa. King Agrippa. Believest thou the prophets? That's a question. Paul standing before the council. They accuse him of blasphemy. They accuse him of disloyalty. They accuse him of causing confusion. They accuse him of mashing up the city. They accuse him of spreading false doctrine. But when Paul was brought before Festus and King Agrippa, Paul said, Believest thou the prophets? Paul said, I know. I know you believe the Old Testament. Look, look at verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost. Thou persuadest me, Paul, to be a Christian. What was that conviction? Almost persuaded. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Paul almost, and then Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Listen to me. Paul was very clear with the message. Brothers and sisters, that is why it's good to shield the gospel. It's good to go to the byways and hedges. When you go to work tomorrow, meet someone on the job. Tell them about the love of God. Share your faith. God will do the convicting. You can't force people to become Christians. But you have a power within you. That when the Holy Spirit starts to speak People are going to be persuaded. People are going to see you as authentic. People are going to see you as genuine. People are going to see you as a true believer. And that's what we need in the church today. Too much phony things. We need real genuine stuff. We want people who can pray and get answers. We need people when they get on their knees and they call upon God. As we heard yesterday, listen man, everything will begin to shake around you. Your fears will shake. Your faith will begin to stand strong. Everything around you will begin to say, God is real. Where you work, where you work, do they know you're a Christian? Perhaps I need to come down your job tomorrow. You can invite me to come. And they said, that's your pastor? I've never heard his name. Me and your work, you never mentioned Pastor Sharp's name, praying for them. 
Oh, I didn't know my sister go to church there. When you're a Christian, you got to say like Jeremiah. Felt like the fire what? Shut up in his bones. When you know Christ, nobody can silence you. When you know the Lord as your Savior, you get excited. Some people listen to me. Paul said, listen, Agrippa, those things that happened, these things that happened to me, they were not done in a corner. Listen to me. I don't have time to hide and seek. It was done in the open. God knocked me down on the Damascus Road. My life has been changed. Now I have a testimony. A long time you don't hear some believer cry out and testify. Remember the days, man, Christians, man, used to have altar call from one ball from that altar, and you hear the other one. Man, it's like revival coming. Oh, the Holy Spirit took over. I want to tell you, we want the Spirit of God to reign in our church. That's who we need, nothing else. Agrippa said, Paul, if you did not appeal to Rome, because he was a Roman citizen, he would have set you free. But he says, you make appeal, you have to go before Caesar. But as far as we're concerned, you're authentic. You're a genuine man. The Holy Spirit makes Christianity real. You shall receive what? Power. That's what the church needs. The form needs to go. And we need the power wherever we go so that people know we have been in touch with the man of Galilee. Yes, sir, let the world know on whose side you stand. Conviction shows man the state of his sin. The one who can save from sin. And refusal to accept the Savior. You will face the judgment and the condemnation of Almighty God. When a person rejects the Holy Spirit, you're rejecting a person. You're rejecting life. You're rejecting the very oxygen you need to breathe. You're rejecting the Son of God. And that is why he said when the Holy Spirit is come, he will reprove the world of sin. He will convict. He will do the things that he ought to do. I pray, my brothers and sisters, that in our lives today, in our hearts, that we'll receive. And then lastly, in closing this message, the work of the Holy Spirit in redemption, sorry, in regeneration. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, Paul writing to Titus, one of his spiritual sons, he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he save us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I stand before God someday and he were to ask me, why should I let you into my heaven? All I can say, God, it's your grace and mercy. That's my visa to heaven, God's blood, God's grace and mercy. I don't deserve to stand before God. I should have been cast into hell. But God's mercy, and I want to tell you, we all sinners before God today, had it not been for the cross and his blood, will die and go to hell. That is why you don't point your finger at someone and say, you'll never make it to the kingdom of God. God's grace and mercy. I don't know who you will save. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. Paul said I went persecuting the church. But he says, by the grace of God, I'm what I am today. You're here not because of your religiosity. Not because of the church you used to go to. Not because you've been baptized. Not because you've been received. Not because you're from a certain family. Not because you went to a college or a university. You're here because of the sheer goodness and grace of Almighty God. That is why we're in church and we're serving God. Too. Give God a praise, man. When I see the blood... When I see the blood, chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save. I want to tell you, being born again. In John chapter 3, we find Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews, important man. 
The same he came to Jesus by night. We are not sure he came by night. Didn't want anybody to see him. But he said unto him, Good master, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. But listen to the part Jesus was interested in. Jesus answered, said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Except a man be what? Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you'll never enter into heaven. Some of you grew up in churches that told you, once you have to just come to church, do the good work, give up a few offerings, and that will be all right. Jesus said to Nicodemus, that's not all right. You must receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. He said you must be born again. There must be a new birth. The first time you were born, we were all born in sin. Am I right? The Bible said we were all born in sin, shape and iniquity. But when you come by faith to Jesus, on the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, he convicts you of sin. And that's why you can say, Lord, I come to you today. Eternal life is available if we only come to Jesus. Faith being the human responsibility or response. And the channel through which God's grace is received. I come to him by faith. Not by doing good works. So some people said I was a bad Christian pastor. I did good. I fed the poor along the road. Thank God that's good. But I'm asking the question. Have you been born again? Pastor I attended that church. And I was close to the minister. But the minister can't save you. Say so you must be born again. Pastor, I take communion. Nobody could take communion more than I do. Jesus said, you must be born again. But he said, Lord, I've been baptized three and four times. Every time I sin, they baptize me. Make sure you don't get drowned. But Jesus said, you must be born again. In other words, we are born once in sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I said to you, I'm going to heaven, not because of my good works. I'm going to heaven because of God's grace and mercy. That's why when people point fingers at me and say, oh, pastor, I don't like you. I, I say, well, let's go. Jesus loves me. Amen. And then I say, I love you too. And some people, they don't like my head at all. Perhaps I'm too handsome for them to love me. But God loves you, and that's all that matters. And the end of the journey is not what people say about you. It's what God says. And no doubt people said nice thing about Nicodemus. But Jesus looked at him and he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Such was Zacchaeus, the tax collector. In Luke chapter 19, he had so much. He was popular. He was known by the world. And some people strive for popularity. You know, some people never become Christian because of P-R-I-D-E, -I -P pride. Paul said to Festus and said to King Agrippa, this was not done in a corner. When you get saved, brother, let, listen to me. I watched Sister Jessica this morning in Sunday school as she was doing. I said, look at the grace of God. God bless you, sister. She wouldn't know I sat there and I watched her. And she was, it's like she, perhaps she thought she would have preached this morning instead of me. But God bless her. And I look, I like to see young Christians. And I watch her grow. And I said, she was so excited about what she was saying. That's it. When you become a child of God, you get excited. You know, the things you used to do, man, the things I used to do, what? I do them no more. Places I used to go, I go them no more. Paul said he was the worst of sinners. Paul said, listen, I don't even deserve to be included in the family of God. But he said, the grace of God. And when God saves you, it's the grace of God. That's what you as regeneration. Does that make one perfect? But it places that person in the family of God. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit makes us grow into God's image on a daily basis. When you are born again, then you begin to grow. I tell you, when you get real, listen, man. You know, I'm in the church a long time. And that's why I tell people they can't fool me. 
I'm in the church for a long time. Well, I look so dear. I got saved so young and I've seen, I've seen salt. I've seen the freshness. I've seen stony hearts. I've seen softened hearts. I've seen the devil at work. I've seen God at work. I've seen so many things. Listen, I've seen churches on fire. I've seen churches get cold. I've seen Christian backslide. I've seen new people come to Jesus. I've seen some in the church that used to jump. And if you don't mind, they push you out of the way. I'm saved and I know I'm saved. And as carnival come around, they're done with church. And sometimes you wonder. But when you have Jesus, you truly have him. When you know him as your Lord and Savior. And listen, man, get excited about him. God's word and his spirit is present with us, present with us today. The spirit filled life is one of dependence. Progress can be made only by we trust in Jesus Christ. And when you are saved, there are some characteristics. We put on Christ likeness. That's one of the great things about being a child of God. Filled with the Spirit, you become like Christ, Christ likeness. Secondly, your worship and praise take on a new spark. You become Christ like. And so when you start to bless the name of God, people realize that you have it. The Spirit of God. That is why I say to our worshipers, I say to those who play instruments, I say to those who teach, I say to we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. So when we begin to do God's work, God, the Spirit of God takes over. And when people come to our services, before pastors start to preach, they said, I've met the Savior. And then lastly, the Spirit filled life. Not only Christ's sadness and worship and praise become a reality, but also submissiveness and service for the Lord. You become so humble before him. And you're willing to serve God in whatever capacity. You just want to hear, we're going over there to have an open air service. Boy, me on board. We're going down there to visit. I'm on board. We're going to pray. Boy, that coming up three nights, come to me in, Pastor. You're so anointed. You're so spirit-filled. Sunday morning, my God, I can't stay home. Stay home for what? Boy, everybody have to wait on the food when we get home, but not now. I have to be in Sunday school. I have to be at church. That's when you really have it. God wants to do something wonderful in our life. God wants to do it. You're in this, I'm going to ask you to stand. You're in this service today. You stand. You're in this service. You want God to do something marvelous in your life. Just stand. Just stand. Say, God, I want to do something marvelous. It's between you and your God. Between you and God. I want to do, God, I want to do something marvelous. I'm tired of the coldness. I'm tired of the deadness. I'm tired of the form. I need a revival. I need it now in my soul. I'm going to ask you to do something more than standing because anybody can stand. But if you're deeply concerned about your own spiritual walk, or if you're not a Christian and you need help, and if you're a Christian and you need a closer walk, the altar is open. I'm going to ask you from the back. Let's come up. Let's come. Just come. Let's come. We're going to sing a song. But let's come from the back right up. You want a closer walk with God. You're not coming to a pastor. Come on. We can come together now. We can come together. You want God to do a marvelous work. Come on. You're, you're, you're tired of the form. You're tired of just coming to church. You're saying, God, I want you to do something supernatural. In my life today, I want you to come through. I want you to come from the back. 
Others can come. You're not a Christian. You can come. You can receive Christ. You're a Christian. Yes, you can come. Come, come. God, I want you to do something. I'm tired of the form. Come, the altar. Some of you just go down so others can come. Come, 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 come. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Sing it with me. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us. Come on, this is serious business. Hallelujah. Yes, thine the glory. Tell him, Hallelujah. Tell him, God, I want to do something in my life. I'm tired. I'm tired of the fall. I'm tired of going through the emotion. I need you to do something. Sing that part again. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Say hallelujah. Yes, thine the glory. Yes, Rafa. Revive us again. Sing that part. Revive us. Tell him, God, you want it to happen in my life. Fill it heart with thy love. Yes, may it so be rekindled with fire from heart. Sing it. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. Yes, hallelujah. Thy the glory. Revive and everybody us. gonna sing this for all glory and praise. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. Who has born? All my sin and has cleansed praised him. Say hallelujah, thank the Lord. Tell him God hallelujah. Yes. your heads bow and your eyes closed. This is an important moment. This is an important moment. The devil fights it more than any other moment. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, like he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's no question about it. You need to repent. You need to ask him, Lord, come into my life. Then if you're a believer, and if you tell me you're satisfied with your Christian walk, then I'll doubt you seriously. We're never satisfied. Come on, we are filled, we are cleansed by the Spirit of God. But on a daily basis, come on, we need to grow in grace, in Christ's likeness. So we want to be more and more like Him. So we need to allow the flesh to go. We need to come against sin and all of its scourges. We need to tell ourselves, I need a cleanse. I need a deeper walk with God. I've been in the church a long time. I want the fire to come back. God is saying, I'm counting on you. We want the fire of the Holy Ghost. If you're not a Christian, you can be saved right now in this service. You can be saved. God wants to change your life. God wants to forgive you of that sin. So we're going to pray for that. And if you're a believer, we're going to pray as well. So bow your heads in prayer. And we're going to talk to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every unbeliever at this altar. I pray for those who have walked forward in obedience to your Holy Spirit. I pray that the judgment of God might more go away because your grace is available. I pray right to remember mercy. And I pray when you're about to devour, I pray in Jesus' name that you remember them. We pray for our young people. We pray for our adults. We pray for our men. We pray for our ladies. I pray for mothers. I pray for fathers. Those who do not know you, I pray that you bring conviction. 
by your Holy Spirit. Lord, you're here. You said when you come, you convict the world of sin. I pray right now that the convicting power, the same power that convicted Agrippa. Oh, God, and he said to Paul, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. I pray that God, they might not only be convicted, but they might surrender to you. And say, God, I surrender my life. Lord, I pray you'll break through. We pray for breakthroughs. We have been praying for it. Breakthrough today. Breakthrough today. Breakthrough today. Give liberty at this altar. Those who are, the Lord, hooked by different things, sex and sin and all the frivolities of life. We come against darkness today. And we pray that your light might shine even in this darkness. So that your people can be set free. In the name of Jesus. We pray for renewal. We pray for a breakthrough. We pray for deliverance. We pray for a touch from heaven. In Jesus name. Save them Lord. Save them. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for saving. Then we pray for those who have been Christians. Walk in the light of God. They love you. But they realize they have been harassed by the enemy. Sometimes they get discouraged. Sometimes they get frustrated. Sometimes they are saying to themselves, I just feel like giving up. I just feel like just, just, just putting down the towel. I pray in the name of Jesus that that baton, they might pass it on. They might not give up, but they might fight to the end, knowing that the end will be wonderful. Touch our brothers and sisters. Revive us as a church. Send a mighty revival. We have just sung about it. God, we need it. We need a revival. Revive every Sunday school class. Revive our missionary department. Revive our youth department. Revive our church. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you'll come through. I pray for breakthrough. Breakthrough in my life. Breakthrough in the believer's life. May we live here different. May we live here transformed. We are tired of being pushed about by the enemy. We are tired of going around in circles. We are tired of the world laughing at us. And we are saying, what else? What can we do? I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll come through today. Come through, Lord. Come through, Lord. You're standing at this altar today. You came here not a Christian, but you heard the invitation and you walk up and you want the Lord to save you. Just raise that hand. Just put it up in the air. Yes, I see on the other hand. Yes, I see hands going up. Yes, I see hands going up. You want God to save you. We know the faces. Come on. Yes, I see that hand. There are others who you need, you need God to do a great work in your life. I tell you, God wants to save. The Lord is coming back soon. And that is why we cannot afford to be left behind. You need Jesus. You need him. The silver and gold won't do it. The popularity won't do it. People are tired of that. We need something real. We need something more powerful than silver and gold. God wants to do it. Then you're a believer and you want to be entirely sanctified. And you believe God has done a work for you this morning. Just raise that hand and just give God some praise. Yes, yes, thank him. Thank him for what he has done. Thank him for what he has done. Thank him. Yes, give God a praise. Give him a praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Ah, yes, hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive. Yes, sir. 